Welcome. My name is Annie Rogers, and on behalf of the Attitude team, I'd like to thank you for joining today's ADHD Experts presentation, How to Reduce Social Anxiety and Foster Connections. Many adults with ADHD struggle with rejection, sensitive dysphoria, as well as fears of embarrassment or criticism in social situations. They worry about missing conversational cues, saying the wrong thing and being judged for it, and about making bad impressions. These worries and fears about social situations, coupled with emotional dysregulation and other facets of ADHD, can interfere with friendships, relationships, work, and even daily routines and other activities. In today's webinar, we will learn more about how social anxiety and rejection sensitivity impact adults with ADHD. And we'll leave here with pr some practical tools and strategies to help overcome some of the limiting beliefs and manage social, social situations with ease and confidence. Leading today's presentation is Dr. Sharon Selene. Dr. Selene is clinical psychologist and author of the award-winning book, What Your ADHD Child Wishes You Knew, Working Together to Empower Kids for Success in School and Life. And she is the creator of the ADHD Solution Deck. She specializes in working with children, teens, emerging adults, and families living with ADHD, anxiety, learning disabilities, high-functioning autism, twice exceptionality, and mental health issues. Her unique perspective as a sibling in an ADHD home, combined with decades of experience as a clinical psychologist and educator, clinician, and consultant, assists her in guiding families and adults toward effective communication and clearer connections. She lectures and facilitates workshops internationally on topics such as understanding ADHD, executive functioning, anxiety, motivation, different kinds of learners, and the teen brain. Dr. Sleen is a regular contributor to Attitude and psychologytoday.com, a featured expert on mass appeal on WWLP TV, and a part-time lecturer at the Smith School for Social Work. Her writing has been featured in numerous online and print publications, including MSN, The Psychotherapy Networker, Smith College Studies in Social Work, Attention Magazine, Attitude Magazine, Psych Central, and Inquirer.com. You can learn more about her at www.drsharonceline.com. Before I hand over the microphone, I have just a few housekeeping items. For those of you tuned in to the live webinar, you may download the slides now by clicking on the event resources section of your webinar screen. And if you are interested in the certificate of attendance option, look for instructions in the email you will receive around an hour after the live broadcast. If you are listening in replay or podcast mode, Visit attitudemag.com and search podcast 395 to access the slides, the webinar replay, and the certificate of attendance option. If you support the work we're doing here at Attitude to strengthen the ADHD community, we encourage you to visit attitudemag.com slash subscribe and sign up for Attitude Magazine for your family or to share with a teacher or a loved one who could benefit from greater ADHD understanding. Finally, the sponsor of this webinar today is Inflow. Inflow is the number one app to help you manage your ADHD. Developed by leading clinicians, Inflow is a science-based self-help program based on the principles of cognitive behavioral therapy. Click the link on your screen to download Inflow now or get Inflow on the App Store or Google Play Store. Attitude thanks our sponsors for supporting our webinars. Sponsorship has no influence on speaker selection or webinar content. So without any further ado, I'm so pleased to welcome Dr. Celine. Thank you so much for joining us today and leading this really important discussion on social anxiety. 
Thank you, Annie. Uh, thank you, Attitude, for um, inviting me here today. Uh, that was a beautiful introduction. I really appreciate it. And I'm going to just get started because we have a lot to talk about. We're talking today about uh, ADHD and anxiety and social anxiety in particular. And the information that I'm going to be sharing today is relevant to older teens, uh, emerging adults, also known as young adults, and uh, older adults, the rest of us as well. So let's talk a little bit about anxiety and how it works with ADHD. We know that anxiety disorders are problems related to fears and worries. Anxiety disorders differ based on the focus of a person's worry. And anxiety is all about safety and security. It wants to make uncomfortable feelings and uncertainty go away immediately. <clears throat> Anxious adults often have lower self-confidence as well as professional or peer difficulties and higher incidence of family conflict. Um, now, anxiety is a natural human response that comes from serving a purpose. It's part of how we're wired. And so our goal can never be to dismiss it entirely, but rather to respond to it in ways that are healthy and manageable. Anxious people struggle with tolerating uncertainty, solving problems effectively, um, and often um, get wrapped up in the drama of the anxiety. What we want to learn to do is how to be bored by anxiety, not frightened by it. There's a genetic component to anxiety, which is more like a predisposition. Uh, to it. If you uh, had anxious parents or you have anxious parents, uh, you are more likely to be anxious and to perceive ambiguous situations as threatening. Um, roughly one fifth to one half of adults with ADHD have a major depressive disorder. And there's also a link between ADHD and substance abuse disorder, which is well documented. And studies suggest that 25 to 40 percent of adults with substance abuse disorder also have ADHD. And perhaps the most important statistic I want to share with you today is that 50 percent of adults with ADHD have an anxiety diagnosis, which is interesting because for children up to the ages of 17 or 18, it's more like 34%. So as we mature uh, at, with, at, with ADHD, as people mature with ADHD, the chances of having an anxiety diagnosis actually increase, not decrease. Okay, let me see, can I advance the slide? Nope, I cannot. Okay, so um, now, there's a difference between nervousness, worry, and anxiety. So nervousness is uh, an, un an uncertainty that diminishes when a skill is learned. Worry is about expecting a negative outcome. And anxiety is a condition of over-responding to a fear or worry. Worriers, and I'm one of them, uh, we, we, we turn what-ifs into believable situations. Now, Worry is how we think about something. Anxiety is our physical response based on triggers. Now, the flip side of being a worrier is that we're great planners. We have terrific future-focused thinking and creative ways of seeing things. You definitely want to go on a trip with a worry with someone who has a little bit of worry and anxiety because we're going to, you know, investigate all the things to do before we go there. Um, there are two types of worry that lead to anxiety. Productive worry, which is worry about doing things, homework, getting to work on time, remembering to charge your phone. These traits contribute to the helpful planning side of anxiety. And then there's poisonous worry. Worry about things you cannot control. Thunderstorms, whether people will like you, if the plane you're on will crash. So we want to think about how anxiety affects us before we delve into the subspecialty or the sub, you know, category of anxiety called social anxiety. So um, anxiety affects our motivation. Anxiety affects our ability to co complete tasks. And anxiety affects our memory. And anxiety affects our self-esteem. There are um, a number of diagnoses under the umbrella of anxiety, and I wanted to just take a minute to share the anxiety spectrum with you. 
So, you know, early on, um, well, you know, when kids are very young, uh, between the ages of zero and six, they'll have stranger anxiety, separation anxiety. Between the ages of six and 12, we'll start to see specific phobias, like real world dangers, something about fires or deaths or thunderstorms. I had a client who was terrified of lightning. Um, where their kids are trying to determine how imminent a danger is and how to learn and learning how to manage their concerns about that danger. In middle school, we see uh, information, uh, we see anxiety, excuse me, <laughs> uh, as information about the growing social importance and social comparisons that lead to worries about acceptance and fitting in. There are concerns about athletic and academic performance as well as peer pressure. And in high school, all of those concerns continue uh, with the added concerns about risk and safety, finding a group that reflects your chosen identity, larger world issues, moral questions, and your future path. So let's talk a little bit now about social anxiety. So social anxiety is a fear that people will scrutinize you in either a familiar or an unfamiliar situation. Um, it, it typically can start or around uh, in adolescence, around age 13. It used to be called a social phobia, um, and that's shifted because um, the the uh, the powers that be, the people who write the DSM-5, the Manual for Diagnosis, felt that it's actually not a phobia; that it should be a, ca a category in and of itself. And approximately 15 million adults in the United States, 6.8 of the population, meet the criteria for social anxiety disorder. Um, and that's, uh, that's a, a, a statistic more about the neurotypical population. It doesn't address the neurodivergent population. Um, perfectionism, while not um, a type of anxiety specifically, is, uh, is, is basically uh, defined as a combination of excessively high personal standards and overly critical self-evaluations that are directed at the self, uh, and, uh, come up socially, or on at others. And so particularly uh, when we think about um, per, when we think about social anxiety, there is a component of perfectionism in a sense that there is a sense that individuals um, may think that other people are judging them harshly because they are not perfect in some way and they have to display perfection to gain approval. So how does anxiety work in the body? I'm not, we're gonna to spend too much time on this, but we all receive information from our bodies about anxiety, physiological states, uncomfortable bodily states, cognitive information, that's that worried thinking, and psychological information, the distorted beliefs. So we know that anxiety is adaptive and prepares our bodies for real danger. Um, and so what happens is that, um, there, in today's society, because we're not usually walking around in the jungle um, and, oh my God, you know, there's a tiger, I've got to run back to my cave and then, hmm, should I go out again because I'm still hungry, I want to look for food and I go out and I hear the same crick crick of, of something of a branch that I heard when I saw when the tiger came out and I start to panic, my whole body has the same response, but it's only a monkey swinging through the cheese. So what happens is that there's often this false alarm, these episodes of fear or worry in absence of a genuine threat. And sometimes there's a real concern, but the reaction is disproportionate to the event itself. So what happens is that our sympathetic nervous system clicks in. Our, there's a trigger. Our bodies react with fight, flight, or freeze when we're stressed. Um, and what and a lot of this, what ha happens initially is it's it's not conscious. The information comes in, and our uh, our hypothalamus uh, sends a message to our limbic system and other parts of the brain: alert, alert and starts to, what we start to have is adrenaline and cortisol and norepinephrine coursing through our bodies um, in because of the hypothalamus response to sensory information. The thinking part of our response 
comes a little bit later. Um, and so when we look at this chart of where do we want to intervene when we have anxiety, most people intervene but when the anxiety has already shown up or and about the beliefs. And actually, we want to intervene between the trigger and the thoughts. So there's a difference between real danger, I'm... Um, I'm uh, uh, walking um, in, in, in an area uh, where there's a lot of broken glass and people are drinking. It's at night. Um, I'm feeling insecure and dangerous. I don't know what would happen. And a perceived danger, I'm going into, um, I'm going into a meeting and I don't know what's going to happen. And so, but the but we can have the same set of responses because in both situations we're triggered with this sense of insecurity. I'm not safe, and that's, that's the thought that comes up next. So we want to learn how to distinguish between these various perceptions and to remember that anxiety reflects all or nothing thinking and a negative expectancy. How does the ADHD brain respond under stress and anxiety? So flooding is the result of emotional uh, regulation issues from living in a world that's not really designed for neurodivergent brains. The lack of filters in the ADHD brain for internal and external stimulation combine with that full-on switch when feelings come into awareness and the flooding begins. So when we're thinking about dealing with anxiety, it's the patterns related to the anxiety that are much more important than the content. If you spend time on trying to reduce the content, if you're a clinician watching this, or if you're someone who experiences anxiety and you're constantly trying to solve the various problems of anxiety, you're going to play whack-a-mole and unsuccessfully because you'll solve one thing and something else will come up. What we want to look at is how anxiety operates for you. Now, there are different stages of emotional intensity in the base in this. And I want this is inspired by Dr. Marcy Caldwell. There's uh, the baseline. You're in the flow. You're comfortable. You're calm. You have some control over your thinking and your attention. You're feeling good. That's the baseline. Then there's level one, the disturbance in the field. The feeling something is not right. You feel it's mildly present, but you can ignore it successfully. Level two, activation. Uh, the alert system has been activated. The feeling is uncomfortable. It's harder to ignore. It's harder to disengage. And you're starting to feel overwhelmed. And what you're also experiencing is some rumination. You're thinking, you're thinking, oh, you're overthinking something. Level three, you're in high alert. This is a total focus on the feeling. Reason has completely taken a, a trip to the Bahamas. It's impossible to ignore your feelings. Uh, your body is now in a full am amygdala hijack with um, adrenaline coursing through your body, as well as cortisol and norepinephrine. Your muscles are tight. You're ready to fight or flee. You might be perspiring. You might Your digestion has shut down, so you might be feeling a little nauseated. You might have um, diarrhea. Um, you might be perspiring to try to cool off the heat that's been generated in your system. Um, when these physical symptoms are present, uh, that, is not, that is an indication of flooding, but it's also an indication that you have to address the physical symptoms first before you can address anything. And the tool to address those physical symptoms actually is breathing. That is, the, that is breathing and changing the environment. Those two things really help you. And so you have to practice breathing outside of the panic, outside of those, those trigger moments. And this is why mindfulness and meditation can be very helpful so that you can go to a moment of breathing and pay attention to your breathing to settle yourself down. That is the traditional way that we think about dealing with anxiety. Now, when we talk about dealing with social dealing with social anxiety, there are some differences. So social anxiety is, as I, is this this fear, this debilitating fear that someone may humiliate you, someone may reject you. It's fundamentally attached to a core belief of deficiency. 
it lasts for at least six months and can restrict activities, interests, and relationships. Now, plenty of people suffer from social anxiety and don't have a diagnosis of the disorder. So today I'm going to be talking about social anxiety in that light, whether you have a, a diagnosis or not. Um, interestingly, um, the National Institute of Mental Health has found that 12% of all adults experience social anxiety disorder, and it's one of the most common anxiety diagnoses. Uh, Gunther, age 28, says, I feel that a lot of times I genuinely do want to socialize and get to know people, but trauma and fear of rejection disables me from doing it. It's hard to fight my brain to meet this goal. So the traits of social anxiety, um, you know, this idea, so you, there could be a response to a trigger such as a conversation or a performance carrying out a function in front of other people or uh, being observed in a way that's beyond the actual threat of the situation. All of these things are triggers. I'm in, I am, have to have a conversation. I may have to stand up and speak someone, or I want to order a coffee at a cafe. Um, and the perception is I'm in danger while I'm doing that. So for example, you really want to get a coffee and a muffin at your favorite cafe, but you're so freaked out that people are looking at you online before you can order your muffin or your coffee, you leave without getting anything. And you, you, you don't have uh, the internal resources to both calm yourself down and talk back to that fear. We're gonna talk about that today. You can be an extrovert and have social anxiety. Maybe it's tough to be in open spaces with a lot of people. Or maybe it's tr it's just difficult to have to be a public speaker or make a presentation. Or maybe you overthink things, even if you aren't in a bad situation, but you're worried it could shift that way. What are the elements of social anxiety? So there's a cognitive element. Um, then there's a behavior element. Um, so the cognitive element, you know, is uncertainty about how an event or task will unfold, and that lies at the core of anxiety. Um, there's um, there's the this uh, this question of of what how am I going to respond to this um, this perception that things are not going the way I'd like them to. There's an emotional response. I'm feeling afraid. I'm not sure what to do. I'm scared. And there's a psychological response, which means that, um, you know, uh, the, the negative beliefs that are associated with it. So when we talk about social anxiety, there's a fundamental disconnect between how a person actually appears to others and their own exaggerated, often negative perceptions of themselves. This is one of the reasons why social anxiety was removed from the phobia category, because it is um, because it's more than a phobia. It's not just I'm afraid of spiders or getting on an elevator. It's that there's underlying core beliefs that are activated. So let's run our first poll. Um, and Natalie can, this is our only poll actually, but I'd love to connect our community here where we are, we're a number of people all curious and perhaps struggling with social anxiety. So we have this poll, Natalie has launched it for you. Um, what are your core beliefs related to social anxiety? Because unlike general anxiety, um, which is about the fear, um, of a particular, event or a worry related to an event or perhaps a core belief that you can't manage whatever the fear is. With social anxiety, there's a core belief of deficiency. I am not okay. I am not enough. And for people with ADHD who've been raised receiving negative information about who they are from peers, from, adult, from caring adults, from teachers, from educational systems, from coaches, uh, athletic coaches or music teachers, this core deficiency fuels social anxiety and this is what we wanna work on. So I don't know if I can launch the results. I'm gonna try to do that. Yes, I can, okay. I am so excited about this. <laughs> Okay, so the number one belief is I will embarrass myself. 
Um, and the number two belief is I will do or say uh, I will I will make a bad first impression. Um, and the next and their next one is I will say or do something offensive and people won't like me right away. So um, I'm making sure that you can see those results. And now I'm going to go back to the slides. Super excited about the technology here, everybody. OK, so of course, if you struggle with social anxiety, um, you worry about what people think about you. You may also struggle with rejection sensitivity disorder. So what is rejection sensitivity disorder? Um, this is a common coexisting condition with ADHD, but it's not a formal diagnostic category. Rejection sensitivity disorder refers to the intense feelings related to the belief that you have let other people down, embarrassed yourself, failed at something, or made a serious, unfixable mistake. And as a result, people pull back their support, love, or respect. RSD um, causes extreme emotional pain that plagues both children and adults, even when no actual rejection has, may have taken place. People with RSD struggle with letting go of past hurts or rejections and experience heightened emotional sensitivity. They may hold on to unkind words or actions directed towards them for months or years. You just can't seem to shake off that comment or believe at some level that you deserve them. You think you've fallen short and with your exquisite sensitivity, no matter what anyone else says, you just can't bounce back. It's especially tough for people with RSD to recover from personal criticism, and that they and there's a sense of living a daily in a one-down position. Uh, there's a huge amount of shame that is associated with both social anxiety and rejection sensitivity disorder. So, what are some signs of RSD? Um, the, 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 this idea of uh, struggling with this low self-worth, easily embarrassed. Um, you, there's a quick anger response with RSD, um, particularly if you feel rejected or you feel like someone's wronged you or you're getting some criticism or that it seems wrong or unfair. Um, and you also have high expectations of others. And of course, you may very well anticipate rejection in new situations. So what we're gonna talk about is how to change your relationship to worry. Um, we want to change the relationship to worry by, by investigating it like a puzzle. Instead of hating it, instead of wishing it would go away, instead of spending a lot of time on why, 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 we want to look at what, how, where, and when. So, Instead of saying, I'm never going to worry, I wish I could never worry, we're going to expect to worry. Worry says, blah, 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 and you can't handle it. Anxiety in general is an overestimation of the problem and an underestimation of the resources available to deal with it. You want to work on creating solutions to reduce the power and influence of your worry. This means brainstorming things to say to yourself when your worry rears its ugly head. The other thing that you want to do, and this is really important, is to recall a time when you were afraid of something and met the challenge successfully. What were the steps that I did in that situation? What did I say to myself? How did it work out? Anxiety is very talented at erasing memories of courage and triumph. The learning process happens over time by reminding yourself, or if you're a, a, a clinician or a coach who's watching or a parent, your, 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 your client or your child, your teen, of the ways that they've, of people have succeeded in the past. Now, social anxiety 
in particular, benefits from cognitive behavioral interventions. Whether you take medication or not for anxiety, it, it, the, just like with ADHD, whether you take medication or not, skills are important. And pills don't teach skills. Pills can help you absorb those skills. Pill, pills can help you apply those skills because you're going to metabolize them differently. But pills don't teach skills. So what is your goal? Your goal is to establish healthier alternatives to safety-seeking behaviors, being able to be present instead of lost in the thoughts you've created about what other people think about you. This is the toxicity of social anxiety. I'm worried about what someone else is thinking about me, and I'm projecting onto that person all the negative things that I think they're thinking about me, which generally don't really make a lot of sense and probably aren't true. Um, so uh, we want to set behavioral goals that are low-risk experiments to build confidence. These are learning experiences that test and defy and shift those negative self-beliefs. So let's say that there, there's usually a pattern that's associated with social anxiety. So before an event uh, or a contact, there's nervousness. During the event or the contact, there's nervousness. Afterwards, there's judgment and recrimination. So let's see if, let's give an example. So let's say a woman decides that they want to join a hiking group. She sees herself as deficient because she's not socially comfortable. Um, people see her as nervous. She has, you know, weaker uh, verbal impulse control when she's stressed, and she doesn't perceive herself as, as a particularly attractive or interesting. So, if all of this shows up, she's not a, a very well going to enjoy the hike, and she'll. Um, but her belief is that she'll be judged poorly and rejected. So what are the negative beliefs associated with this incident? I don't know what to say. People will think I'm stupid. I'm shy, right? The, the goal here is to create alternatives to some of these thoughts. So you're going to set a different behavioral goal. My goal is I'm going to smile at new people and talk to one to two people during the course of this hike. That's my goal. And when I talk to them, I will focus on the conversation in the moment and say a reflective or topic-related comment. Afterwards, I'm going to assess how the situation went. Did, the, did I have a conversation that was awkward but not damaged by it? And you want to maybe write a, write a little summary or a voice memo so you can start to record moments when you confront your social anxiety and do something different. And get through it. Now, mindfulness is a very interesting uh, topic with social anxiety because mindfulness doesn't mean medication. It's one form of practicing mindfulness, just like yoga or Tai Chi or Qigong or whatever. Meditation alone is not an effective treatment for social anxiety. And here's why. Because you are in you are focusing on your own experience, your breath. And in social anxiety, what we want to do is figure out how to be present, okay? So the goal is mindful focus during a situation when you normally feel anxious. That is the goal. So you, just, you, you have some curiosity. You wonder about what's going to happen instead of worrying about it. You're curious about the people you're with. You take an interest in them and you're curious about the present, turning away from the internal noise to what's happening in the present. What socially anxious people do is they evaluate themselves um, in, in real time. So they're not present, but they're consumed with their own thoughts. And they, of course, assume, assume that the other person is judging them poorly as well. So we want to develop a mindful capacity of being in the present. And meditation can be helpful with that um, in combination with that cognitive behavioral um, uh, tool of learning how to address that core deficiency. So we want to develop a capacity for curiosity by practicing reflective listening. And we want to turn our attention away from that internal noise. You're not gonna be able to turn those thoughts off. 
That's not a realistic goal. What is a realistic goal is how to lower the volume on those thoughts and maybe see them like background noise, like music when you're working. You know, you put your music on, you work. I know I put my music on, I'm working on my PowerPoint, I'm cooking away, I'm feeling happy. So we want to be able to take those thoughts and put them in the background so we can attend to what's happening in the present. This is why practicing mindfulness is useful for social anxiety. It's about being present, but not being stuck in the thoughts in your own mind. So what are some tools for addressing a rejection sensitivity dysphoria? So a helpful tip is to consistently nurture your strengths and focus as much as possible on what you love to do and what you do well. You wanna pay attention to your positive efforts. Write down three good or good enough things that happen each day before bed. This will help you see things from a different perspective and shift from negative self-talk to, oh, this is actually going better than I thought. Um, you wanna practice taking a pause before responding to a question or an answer by saying, hmm, that's a good question, let me think about it. Or ask for some time after an unpleasant interaction by saying, I'll get back to you about this. Then you can better assess what's going on and you can check things out before coming to a conclusion. Maybe by asking a neutral person or your therapist or your coach, um, what they think about what you heard. A prearranged tools like time aparts, relaxation techniques, or other healthy soothing activities, going for a run, listening to music, or talking with a friend are also all useful ways to deal with overwhelming emotions. I mean, ideally with mindfulness, what would happen is that you would see yourself as the sky and that overwhelming emotion is a thought, it's a cloud passing along in front of you. It's not, you know, basically coming down over your head, pouring rain all over you, right? It's just something that's passing. Um, you may get into an overfocused loop and drop into a shame spiral. You're unable to forgive yourself for your role in whatever happened. Practice self-compassion. We all make mistakes and learning from them is how we grow. So when things don't go the way you hoped, take the time to regroup. Talk to and treat yourself the way you would approach a third grader with a skinned knee instead of with your finger out scolding. Um, and develop a few self-statements of encouragement that assist you in, recall, in, in reducing that noise. Some ideas of those might be, I'm stronger than I think. My mind is uniquely wired and creative. I can make a mistake and be a good person. I can get hurt and bounce back. So we want to use Q-tip, which is from the Al-Anon, uh, the AA world, which is to stop, quit taking it personally, to actually say that to ourselves. We wanna manage big feelings with stop, think, act, and recover, calling a pause in the action, taking some time away where you're thinking, um, where you're in that pause, um, where you're allowing your body to sort of settle and then think about what's going on, what is the next right thing you want to do, that action, and then giving yourself some time to recover. Now, adult friendships depend on a few things. Proximity uh, is associated with forming and keeping friendships. It's easier to access and spend time with others when you actually are near them. Um, seeing people repeatedly through a range of settings builds trust and enjoyment of each other's company. When it build, you can um, basically then you can gather information about a person's behavior, their likes and their dislikes. Um, you're more likely to make friends with people who like what you do and uh, go to similar places: work, gym, hobbies, religious organizations, etc. And you want to be the friend that, you, it, ideally we want to be the friends that we would like to have, kind and consistent, uh, but there's a mutuality in friendships. And if you're the giver and you're not getting back um, things that are, you know, you're, you find that you're giving all the time and people aren't responding, then that's something that you might want to talk about. Um, but you also want to look 
for ways in which you might be oversharing or dominating conversations and, and, and disrupting a balance in a conversation or in the relationship. We, it's important to pay attention to nonverbal communication. So of course, body language and facial expressions, interest and engagement look open and calm, relaxed posture, eye contact, leaning forward, judgment and discomfort look more closed, crossed arms and legs, looking away. Uh, in our culture, through three feet apart is physical proximity when you're standing and talking to someone, you're keeping your hands and body parts to yourself, particularly uh, without if you don't ask permission. Um, and that would mean as simple as like, um, do you mind if I touch you on the shoulder or, you know, you, ha you can't touch people without having a certain level of familiarity and safety. Um, volume, how are people speaking? Are you speaking louder or quieter than the people around you? Can you hear yourself? Do you have a buddy in a social situation who could signal you if you're a little bit off? What is the tone of voice that you're using or other people are using? This reminds me of that classic Seinfeld episode, and I know I'm dating myself, but there was, you know, Seinfeld was, had, um, he had qualified, uh, he, had a, he had a girlfriend he was seeing and she was a, a long talker and then someone else was a loud talker and a soft talker. And, and I, I, I really always smile to myself when I think about that episode because here he was making a comedy, um, but what he was talking about was so real in our uh, daily lives. And finally, we want to um, notice our body movements. Body movements, tapping your foot, shaking your leg, shaking your hand can be off-putting to others. Uh, if you have a habit of that, to let your people know that your body may do things you're not aware of or you can't control, like, hmm, I may blush. I'm going to call, I'm going to say, you know, maybe at some time when I'm not blushing to say, wow, you know, am I blushing right now? I'm a blusher. And people are like, no, you're fine. And then later when you blush, it's not, it's normalized already. You don't have to feel embarrassed about it. Conversation tips. I want you to make sure that you leave with some tips. So we want to use reflective listening. What I heard you say was, did I get that right? Or not even the, did I get that right? Hmm. It's really interesting when you say blah, blah, blah so that you're taking a piece of what they've said and formulating it into a statement or a question so that they feel heard and you have a little time to, to think about how you might wanna add to that. Um, we wanna ask open-ended questions. That's the when, that's the where, that's the how, that's the what, much less than the why. Um, ask yourself, why am I talking now? Wait now. Um, this is great. You know, am I talking now and are people not listening? Is there a glassy look on their eyes? Am I talking too much? Am I talking too little? Just notice what's happening if you come when you're doing that. We want to um, basically reframe I can't do that into I'm not sure if. If you're uncomfortable with eye contact, and many people, particularly those with ADHD and um, uh, level one uh, autism spectrum disorders are uncomfortable with eye contact, where is a place that you could look that's near the face that's not the eyes? And what I've read is that people sometimes look right here at the hairline. Um, that way uh, you're, you're looking in the direction of the face, but you're looking here and it's kind of hard for the receiver to tell the difference. Um, Sometimes engaging in a distractive activity so people aren't looking right at you is a great way to get together with people, you know, walking or hiking or, you know, one of those paint by number classes or something like that. Uh, with, with teens in particular, driving, shopping chores, that can be very helpful. Um, and we want to focus on one skill at a time. There's one aspect of your social anxiety that bothers you probably more than anything else. Let's focus on that. What is the core um, deficiency, the belief that you have related to that one thing? What do you tell yourself about that one thing? When are some times when you've done something that actually flies in the face of that one thing being a, the dominant um, characteristic? 
Um, these are things that are worth reflecting on. And because many people with ADHD struggle with working memory, with the ability to pull up something from their life experience and apply it in the moment, it might be worth talking to your loved ones about sometimes when you might have done something differently that you can't recall. And finally, I think it's important to be to allow yourself to feel awkward. This is part of my, of 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 mindful uh, mindfulness. It's part of self compassion, and it's part of attentive awareness. You are aware that you're feeling awkward. You don't like feeling awkward. That's okay. You're just feeling awkward. It instead of judging yourself. I'm a loser that I feel awkward. Everyone knows that I feel awkward. Oh my God, what is wrong with me? No, just feel awkward and say, it's okay. It's that third grader with a skin knee. You're feeling awkward right now. I'm here. I've got my arm around you. We're, you know, we can do this. So some, uh, this is a little simple um, thing that I created to be a better communicator. Enjoy an apple ask to join a situation, ask relevant questions and assess what's happening by looking at people's faces and their bodies. Um, it doesn't really work when you go up to people and, and, and say, hey, what are you talking about? Huh? That's really interesting. Um, physical proximity and volume, place yourself appropriately near others and observe their volume and do the same. Participate with curiosity and reflective statements that show you're listening and you're genuinely um, engaged in other people's experiences, lay off the self-criticism and turn down the volume on those negative voices that guess what other people are saying about you because it's often wrong. Stay present and engage with what's happening now. Um, listen when you are around people. And finally, enjoy connecting with others and sharing what's special and fun about you. Um, it's a give and take. Relationships are a give and take. And in terms of pra in terms of relationships being a give and take, I want to say that this is about practice. Practice makes progress. And this is true true with chit chat. A lot of people don't like chit chat or they don't see the point of it, particularly people with ADHD. So you don't have to like it, but you may need the skill. And it would be useful to practice it at low value, low intensity situations. I'm at the grocery store. You could say to the checker, how's your day going? Okay, or you're at the dry cleaners or at the library. You know, nice weather, isn't it? Thank you for helping me. Those are situations that you that you can say something and it doesn't matter, or you can say nothing and that doesn't matter either. So, but they're great opportunities to practice some of those, just those tools related to chit chat. Uh, finally, when we talk about fostering connections, we, I just want to leave you with some basic tools, basically, which is, you know, greet someone with a smile or wave, ask open questions, listen and reflect back what you hear, pause and observe when you enter a room before speaking, start with low intensity activities, getting a coffee or taking a walk when you're meeting someone and getting to know them so that there's another, a third activity that's happening other than just you know, I'm talking to you and you're talking to me, which is one and two. And remember that everybody has insecurities, whether they show them or not. Don't compare your insides to someone else's outsides because you'll end up being wrong and misled. So we're going to reduce uh, social anxiety by nurturing resilience. That's the ultimate goal here. Um, because resilience is the antidote for shame, anxiety, and low self-confidence. We want to build resilience by learning to tolerate the discomfort of not knowing what other people are thinking about me, risking trying to make a connection and maybe feeling disappointed, and believing that I have the capacity to bounce back from things. Resilient people don't blame others or themselves. They ask, what could I do differently? These skills lead to fostering a mentality that taking risks is okay, even if you're worried about the embarrassment of the outcome. This is the heart, the heart of a growth mindset. 
I understand that I can use effective strategies, that I can try new things. I will stumble and I will regroup and I'll try again. I expect that. That's what it means to be human. Um, and that's what's part of living and learning. Focus on the islands of competency, the things that you really love about yourselves, the character strengths. Um, engage in trial and error learning. Find people who care about you and have empathy for you, someone who believes in you. It doesn't have to be George Clooney or Beyonce. This is the charismatic adult in your life who, um, for, who gives, who can, from whom you can gather some strength. Um, Remember that the learning process happens over time by reminding yourself of the ways that you've succeeded in the past. Thank you so much for joining me today. I'm looking forward to your questions. Please stay connected with me. There's a link here for a free handout on everything that I talked about today. So it's filled with, it's a resource for you, filled with all kinds of tips and tools based on the information that I've shared. And um, Annie will and Natalie will send this out to you um, with, in whatever follow-up email they, they share. So I hope that you'll click that link and get your free handout and stay connected with me on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn. But particularly, I invite you to our Friday um, Facebook Lives through Attitude Magazine. It's an incredible community. And each week we talk about different topics related to living with ADHD, whether you're a parent, whether you are an adult, an emerging adult, whoever you are, please join us. Thank you so much for uh, spending your time with me this hour. And I look forward to your questions. Thank you so much, Sharon. Um, before we start on the questions, just a quick uh, thank you again to Inflow for sponsoring today's webinar. Um, one question we are hearing from adults, um, they appreciate the advice, they're taking notes on the tips they say when they get into a social situation, they sometimes feel physically and psychologically paralyzed. They forget mm -hmm. all of these tips. Can right. you offer some advice? Um, is practice the best um, remedy for that paralyzation? <laughs> I think practice is the, re the best remedy, but I also think that what's helpful is to have some phrases in your pocket that can help you um, counter that paralysis. And that's where actually mindfulness can be useful because you could do some alternate nostril breathing, you could do box, breathe, you know, box breathing. I actually use triangle breathing. You breathe in for four, you hold for four, you uh, exhale for six, and you pause because you can do that to sort of settle your nervous system. Because when you're in a paralysis, what that's uh, basically showing you is you're in a freeze mode, right? Fight, flight, or freeze. The amygdala has now taken over and is driving the bus that is you, and we want to get it back where it belongs in the middle of the brain so that your prefrontal cortex can actually do its job, the thinking brain. So I think if you can have one or two things that you can say to yourself that are encouraging statements in that moment and have a go-to breathing exercise that you can use, alternate nostril breathing may not be the best choice because people will think, what is wrong with you that you're touching your nose? So uh, you could put, also put your hand on your chest and really just focus on feeling your chest rise and fall or your belly as you're breathing, or do that um, box breathing or triangle breathing. Wonderful, and we will um, be sure to add those notes as well for those who are looking for some go-to strategies. Mm -hmm. um, one thing that came up in the question about uh, core belief about social anxiety, this one really hit home, and, and I heard it quite a bit. Um, my core belief tells me that I will inevitably mess up in a social situation mm -hmm. that, and that people will stop being my friend. Another person mm -hmm. says, I feel like people will find out I'm not as good a person as they thought I was. So I retreat right. after getting to know somebody, I pull back and I don't make long lasting relationships. I hear this again mm -hmm. and again. And I wonder if you can offer some advice to those people who assume defeat. 
Right. So, so that the core belief then is, to me is I'm not worth being, in, I'm not worthy of someone else's attention. And those thoughts are all part, are all a response to that core belief. And so what I would say to you is, why do you think you're not worthy of that attention? Um, this is where actually a why would come in. You know, what has happened in your life that has led you to believe that you're not worthy of attention? Because actually, if I asked you why, you'd probably say, I don't know. So that is, is something that you want to think about. You know, what's happened that's, that's led me to believe I'm not worthy or I'm not good enough? Because in those moments, that's when we have to have a statement that says, oh, that's that, that's that, um, that's that voice of my, my father who was an alcoholic who basically told me to get out of his way all the time. I actually um, am not that person anymore. You know, I'm a different person. I've grown up and to be someone else. And, and that's just, you know, random example. But I think you understand what I'm saying, Annie, that, you know, in those moments, you really want to talk back to that core belief because the core belief is usually something like, I'm not good enough. Um, I'm not worthy. Um, there's something fundamentally unlikable about me. And those are things that we, you know, are false beliefs that you've learned over time through various interactions. So we, you have to come up with a counter statement and work through that. At some point in your life, that belief might have helped you. It might have helped you stay safe and secure, but it no longer serves you. And if it no longer serves you, it needs to be lovingly put aside and replaced with something else. And that is the practice piece. It takes time and energy and effort to really practice, nope, I don't need you right now, I've got this. Or yep, I'm nervous, but how you're helping me is actually not helping me <laughs> it, to, to, to really take it on in a different way. Right. And you, you touched on this as well in your discussion of uh, rejection sensitive dysphoria, this idea of um, every day writing down three things that mm -hmm. you did well, or three mm -hmm. things you are proud of and, and practicing those mantras. That was very helpful. We had a number of people who are um, trying to help others in their lives, mm -hmm. um, adults mm -hmm. or, or children who mm -hmm. are battling um, rejection-sensitive dysphoria, and they're wondering if you can offer any advice for um, helping those people without discounting their emotions. Right. So discounting emotions is is never is never particularly useful. We want to do yes and. You, of course, yeah, you're feeling this way. There's a reason that you're feeling this way. There's a history that leads you to have felt this way. And then we want to say, what can we do to, 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 to plant a new tree, literally and, and metaphorically, well, not literally, but metaphorically. Um, and literally, we're going to plant some new neural pathways um, because What's happening is that, you know, when people feel this way about themselves, they've, they, they are completely shut off or sh and they shut down any feedback that contradicts that belief. And so you have to hold that for them and be the reminder. Hmm, I know you're feeling this way right now. I, re I do recall a time when blah, 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 and, um, actually, um, you, you took, you know, you, you tried out for the musical, which was really hard and you'd made it. And you, even though it was absolutely terrifying, you went to the first rehearsal and there were two friends and they asked you to sit next to them. So, you know, to try to, to really look at, uh, when the person who's afraid, um, has actually done something in the face of that fear, in spite of having that fear and to hold that for them. I think it's also important to maybe um, to have a you know a, a, a dinner table uh, or in the beginning of a session to do a happy and a crappy. So what's a happy from today? What's a crappy from today? We want to try to shift um, the attention away from the things that aren't working. 
Um, the other thing that I want to say about rejection sensitivity is that a lot of times people who are sensitive have received a lot of negative feedback about being sensitive. Um, you know, you're too sensitive or why, can, why do you have to take things so personally? And that doesn't actually help you change. Uh, instead, what would be nice to say is I am really sensitive. And um, the, the good thing about that is blah, blah, blah. The challenges about that are blah, blah, blah. And so that we can lean into the good things about it while still holding some of those challenges. That was a great, a great way to wrap up, actually, because we had a couple people who were who said exactly that. They said that idea of um, quit taking it personally was a something that had been weaponized against them. And they mm -hmm. were interested in the idea of turning it into a um, into a positive, into a tool. Um, and mm -hmm. so, um, there you go. <laughs> there are some <laughs> strategies for doing that. And, and Annie, you know, people who are sensitive often are very creative. They might be therapists, they might be artists, they might be musicians. It, it, you know, it's not, it, 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 you know, instead of it being like, you know, um, a, you know, a negative label, it could be like a pro a badge of honor. You know, I'm a sensitive person and you know what, that makes me, um, really feel things deeply and connect with people when I can in, in, in a, in a special way so that you, you, you start to own it and not necessarily feel like it's a, um, it's a detriment. Mm. Wonderful. Well, I am the bearer of bad news that we are out of time for today, but Sharon, thank you again so much for leading this discussion today. Um, it was incredibly helpful and, and brought about some great insights. And thank you everyone out there who's listening um, for being a part of our Attitude community. We hope you can join us again. We have another, uh, we have free webinars every week. And next week is actually on uh, why adults with ADHD abandon their treatment plans with Dr. Mm. William Dodson. So um, to make sure you don't miss on any of our future webinars, you can always visit attitudemag.com slash newsletters and sign up to receive our webinar announcements. But for now, thank you, Sharon. Thank you everyone for joining us. We hope to see you again soon. Thank you so much, Annie. And thank you to everyone who joined us.